Hi, this is Manna Jagya. In today's class, we shall be studying Keats's yet another famous poem, Ode to Autumn, or simply To Autumn. So, To Autumn is a poem by this English romantic poet, John Keats, and it was a, a work that Keats composed on 19th September 1819. And this poem was published in the year 1820 in a volume of Keats's poetry that also included Keats's some other works like Lamia and The Eve of St. Agnes. To Autumn is the final work in the group of poem known as Keats's 1819 Odes. We all know that Keats has written some wonderful odes. And in the year 1819, which was the most productive year of Keats's life, he composed six odes. Uh, the first five poems are Ode on a Gracian Urn, Ode on Indolence, Ode on Melancholy, Ode to a Nightingale, Ode to Psyche. And finally, the last ode is Ode to Autumn. So, To Autumn is the final work in the group of poems known as Keats's 1819 Odes. Keats had composed this poem one evening while it was the season of autumn and he was taking a walk near Winchester. Winchester is a cathedral city in Hampshire, England. So while taking a walk here, he composed to autumn. This work marks the end of Keats's poetic career because he needed to earn money and he could no longer devote himself to the lifestyle of a poet. Uh, after a year, a little over a year we can say, after the publication of Two Autumn, Keats died in Rome. This poem has three 11 line stanzas. There are three stanzas and all the three stanzas contain 11 lines each. From the title itself, we can understand that this poem describes the season of autumn. It describes the late maturation of the crops to the harvest and to the last days of autumn when winter is near. In the poem, the season of autumn is personified. So personification is a figurative device which is dominant throughout the poem because Keats is achieving a very rich imagery because throughout the poem he is personifying the season of autumn. He describes the sights, S-I-G-H-T-S. He describes the sights that you see in the season of autumn. He describes the rich bounty and also he talks about the sounds in the season of autumn. He describes the lush fields. He describes the landscapes. And while reading these wonderful descriptions, you feel a warmth and you imagine you can visualize the pictures in front of your eyes. But this work has also been interpreted as a meditation on death. It is also seen as the response of John Keats to Peterloo Massacre because the event of Peterloo Massacre that took place at St. Peter's Field Manchester, Lancashire, England on Monday 16th, August 1819 coincide with uh, the composition of this poem. So it can be also read or interpreted as uh, an allegory of death. So it would be safe to assume that the poem carries an expression of nationalist sentiment. Because it has some wonderful lyrics, the poem to Autumn has been regarded by critics as one of the most perfect short poems in the English language. I'll read the first stanza of the poem and we'll look at what it tries to say. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless, with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the most cottage trees, and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells, with a sweet kernel to set budding more, and still more later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease. For summer has overbrimmed their clammy cells. So here we see that to autumn describes in all the three stanzas, if you look collectively, 
three different aspects of the autumn season is described its fruitfulness in the first its labor in the second and its ultimate decline in the third stanzas through the stanzas there is a progression from early autumn to mid autumn and then to the heralding or the call of winter parallel to this the poem also depicts the day turning from morning to afternoon and then finally into dusk these progressions are joined with a shift sometimes you will see the sense of sight sometimes you will find the sense of sound and hence this poem becomes a perfect example of a three part symmetry you will see three stanzas talking about one part in each section and this is not present in keats's other odes only to autumn has a three part symmetry cleanly divided into three stanzas and all the three stanza have a particular time of the day to denote as the poem progresses you will see autumn is represented metaphorically as one who conspires as one who ripens fruit as one who harvests and as one who makes music the first stanza of the poem clearly represents autumn being involved with this promotion of natural process growth and ultimate maturation in this stanza you will see that the fruits are still ripening buds are still opening in the warm weather so a proper imagery of growth swelling bending plumping is given in the first stanza everything is blooming in the first stanza it is growing let's come to the second stanza now who hath not seen the oft amid thy store sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind or on a half reaped furrow sounds asleep drowsed with the fume of poppies while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers and sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook or by a cider press with patient look thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours so in the second stanza we see autumn is personified as a harvester to be seen by the viewer in various guises the season of autumn is performing laborious tasks which are essential for the provision of food for the coming year we see that the day is progressing into the drowsiness of the afternoon the harvested grain the grain that is already ready the harvested grain is being winnowed now the harvester is asleep or he is returning home also the last lines of the second stanza indicate the last drops issue from the cider press coming to the third stanza where are the songs of spring ah where are they think not of them thou hast thy music too while bard clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue then in a wailful choir the small gnats moan among the river swallows borne aloft or swinging as the light wind lives or dies and full grown lambs loud bleat from the hilly bourn hedge cricket sing and now with treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft and gathering swallows twitter in the skies in the last stanza you see a sudden shift from the sight to the sounds the last stanza contrasts the sounds of the autumn with the sounds of the spring the sounds that are presented are not only those of autumn but these are some essential gentle sounds of the evening gnats are wailing lambs are bleating in the dusk and as night approaches with the final moments of the song the twittering swallows gather for departure leaving the fields bare the whistling red breast and the chirping crickets are the common sounds of winter the references to spring are the growing lambs the migrating swallows all these 
scenery, all these sites, the growing lambs, the migrating swallows, remind the reader that the seasons are a cycle and one after the other, the seasons are going to come. The season depict life. Autumn is always seen as something negative. Spring is always seen as something positive, which indicates that if autumn has come, spring will also come. Seasons do follow one after the other. Though now it is autumn, then it will be winter. Times now may be bad and rough, but soon it is going to be spring. But the poet is also making an attempt to describe the beauty of autumn. He says that autumn is the season of mist. It is a season during which different kinds of fruits ripen and it seems that autumn actively cooperates with the uh, sun bringing out the maturity of the fruit. The autumn and the sun work together for the ripening of all kinds of fruits. The vines running around the edges of thatched roofs become loaded with grapes during the season of autumn. Apple trees growing in the cottage gardens are covered with moss and they are weighed down with fruits. All fruits are filled with sweetness in this season. The gourd grows bigger and the hazelnuts are filled with sweet carnel. Certain flowers also bloom in the autumn. The bees suck the sweetness of these flowers and it seems that these flowers represent a continuation of summer. The sticky cells of honeycomb are filled with overflowing honey. Then when you look at the second stanza, it is describing the occupation, the work, the labor of autumn. And here autumn is personified as a winnower, as a reaper, as a gleaner and as a cider presser. C-I-D-E-R, cider presser. Autumn is also seen as a woman who performs the tasks of winnowing, reaping, gleaning and cider pressing. If anyone wants to see autumn, he may go into the fields and see this woman engaged in the winnowing operation. And the breeze is ruffling her beautiful locks of hair. So here you see that this is a picture of autumn that Keats is presenting. Keats is turning autumn into a beautiful maiden, into a beautiful woman who is working in the fields. We also see autumn in the, sh in the shape of a reaper who is engaged in reaping corn. But then while this reaper is engaged in reaping corn, he is also feeling very drowsy because of being sleepy. He's, he's tired. He's overcome by the sleep in, in, and uh, because of the smell of the poppies. He or she, whoever this reaper is, she falls asleep. Autumn is also seen in the figure of a woman who is crushing these ripe apples. You must have heard about apple cider. It is good for skin. It is good for face. It is good for health also. So here we see a woman who is crushing the ripe apples in the wooden press to obtain a beer juice from which this cider is to be made. Then this woman is sitting by the cider press and watches patiently the apple juice flowing out of the press drop by drop. Then in the third stanza we see the poet describes the sounds of autumn. Spring is distinguished by its own songs and autumn is different. The songs of autumn are different than the songs of spring. These sweet songs are not heard in autumn. The sweet songs of spring are not heard in autumn. But there is no need to feel any regret on that account because autumn has its own peculiar music. The sounds of autumn are heard in the evening when the sun is setting. The fields uh, are covered in a soft glow while the crops are being reaped. The gnats, G-N-A-T-S, the gnats fly among the shrubs and these shrubs are growing on the river sides. These gnats are carried upwards when the wind is strong and then they come downwards when the wind becomes feeble or weak. And these gnats are singing their chorus songs and the lambs are bleating in the landscape. Such beautiful description of different kinds of songs. Third stanza is full of onomatopoeia, figure of speech. You can see the gnats moaning. You can see the full grown lambs bleating loudly. You can see the crickets singing. There is whistling song mentioned. Then the swallows are twittering. 
the poet is mentioning all these sounds purposely because he wants to clear that autumn is no less than spring because there is a lot of beauty in autumn also the troubles and the struggles that we face in our life have their own importance and they are a way to mold us into what we become you see the poem the ode to autumn is a perfect blend is a nice melody in which variety of words are used in a balanced form creating a proper balance between sight and sounds through this poem ode to autumn john keats has been successful enough to brilliantly depict the full grown beauty of autumn along with all its charms so that's all you need to know and learn about ode to autumn thank you